Good evening, everyone. Welcome to NTD Tonight. I'm David Zhang. Here are some of today's top stories. Protests escalate on some college campuses. We'll take a look at recent developments at Columbia University and UCLA. Could the Biden administration reclassify marijuana? That could be the case according to the recent DEA and DOJ announcements. The Biden administration was hit with another lawsuit over rewrites to Title IX. NTD hears from one of the plaintiffs on how Biden doesn't have the power to make such major changes. First up, we'll have more updates on the anti-Israel protests on college campuses. At least 200 protesters have broken into and taken over a campus building at Columbia University. They barricaded themselves inside. Many protesters at Columbia University are refusing to leave, even after yesterday's deadline to vacate. The school says the students who have been occupying a campus building would now face expulsion. Overnight, some anti-Israel protesters occupied a building on campus called Hamilton Hall, breaking windows to gain entry. After confronting university staff, the protesters barricaded themselves inside the building with barriers. Footage shows the protesters flying flags from the building that say Intifada. The term refers to violent attacks against Israel. During the Intifadas of the 1980s and the early 2000s, Palestinian suicide bombers killed nearly 1,000 Israelis in terror attacks. House Speaker Mike Johnson today criticized the campus protesters and announced a, quote, housewide effort to crack down on anti-Semitism on college campuses. What these students are doing is shutting down the campuses, um, you know, taking control of buildings. They are threatening their students' lives. They are chanting death to America. I at some point, you cross the line, and they have. This is not protected free speech. What this is doing is violating the rights of others. Columbia University closed its campus to non-residential students and the media today. Over at other Ivy League schools, Brown University and student protesters reached an agreement, disbanding the encampment. According to the protest group, the school voted to divest from companies that support Israel. At Yale, all protesters left the campus encampment after the university demanded that students end their actions or face discipline, including suspension. Police have also broken up protests at other colleges, including the University of Florida and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Clashes erupted again last night at the University of California, Los Angeles, between demonstrators supporting Palestine and those advocating for Israel. NTD's Christina Corona tells us more from the campus. We're here at UCLA standing in front of Royce Quad, where a pro-Palestinian encampment has been set up for six days. Last night around 11.30 p.m., there were reports of approximately 60 counter-protesters allegedly trying to breach the encampment barrier. Footage taken by Matthew Royer from the Daily Bruin shows pushing, shoving, and shouting between the two groups. Several UC police officers in riot gear, accompanied by security guards, intervened and pushed the counter-protesters back from the area between Dixon Plaza and Powell Library. No injuries were reported. However, yesterday evening, a Palestinian protester allegedly used a taser on a man. I have a class over there. I tried to go through um, this entrance right here. They blocked it off. They wouldn't let, it, let us go, so I had to go around. And as I was going around, I saw like people screaming and this girl tasing a Jewish guy with a taser. Um, and the, the security was just there. They didn't do anything. It's, it's scary. Some students say the encampment is growing by the day. Well, it seems like every day it becomes a little bit more lawless and they create even more system of governance within there. He says as a Jewish student himself, he hasn't felt unsafe until now. Logan says it's still an ongoing issue just trying to get across campus. I know for lots of undergrads here, you're not allowed to walk through. This is the main quad of the campus. It's completely cordoned off by security hired by UCLA to protect the protesters. And so you have to go out of your way about 10 minutes to just make it around this encampment to go to class. Several students attempted to cross the blocked area. Many Palestinian supporters were seen holding towels up to block the media from recording. More than half of the campus is completely blocked off. I'm not able to get to my classes. I'm not able to access the library right over there. This is where I study every single day, and I haven't been there in the, in the past week. 
And who are the security personnel on campus? So there's uh, the campus security, which seems to be just you know, trying to maintain a certain level of safety around here. And there's the uh, people that run the encampment that physically block you out. Many students claim that the university isn't taking sufficient action to address the protest. However, NTD received a statement from Mary Osaka, the vice chancellor for UCLA Strategic Communication, Tuesday. She said, while the demonstration remains largely peaceful, our campus must remain a place where we treat one another with respect and recognize our shared humanity, not a place where we devolve into violence and bullying. As of now, it remains unclear how long the university will allow the encampment to remain in place. Christina Corona, NTD News, Los Angeles. Now let's take a look at other top headlines. Former President Trump's criminal trial in New York City is back on today. Judge ruled that this morning Trump must pay $9,000 fine for violating a gag order and threatened jail time. Here's Trump addressing reporters this morning. So I'm going to go into this trial. I'm going to sit in a freezing cold icebox for eight hours, nine hours or so. As for the gag order, the judge rejected the arguments by Trump's defense team and ruled that reposts on social media are endorsements. The judge threatened to put Trump in jail if he violates the gag order again. There is a court hearing set for Thursday to determine some remaining allegations of times when Trump violated the gag order. Trump's son, Eric Trump, joined him in a courtroom, becoming the first family member to do so. Trump's attorneys have suggested that Trump was engaged in an effort to protect his name and his family, not to influence the outcome of the presidential election. The trial, the first of Trump's four criminal cases to come before a jury, is expected to last for another month or more. Trump is required to be in court when he's in session, four days a week. In North Carolina, four officers were killed in a shooting while on duty yesterday. They were attempting to serve a warrant at a home in Charlotte when the suspect opened the fire. We know it was a, an automatic high-powered rifle that was being used. Uh, uh, several, several rounds were fired from both the individual that was shooting at the officers and, as well as the officers returning fire. Uh, and that went on for several minutes. And... It was just a very tense situation. Police identified the suspect as 39-year-old Terry Clark Hughes Jr. He died during the shootout with police. Four other officers were shot and wounded but are in stable condition. A solemn procession in Charlotte earlier today paid a tribute to one of the officers killed. Authorities are investigating the incident. The Biden administration is planning to reclassify marijuana as a less dangerous drug. The U.S. Department of Justice is planning to recommend that marijuana be rescheduled as a Schedule Three controlled substance, a classification shared by prescription drugs such as ketamine and Tylenol with codeine. For more than 50 years, marijuana has been categorized as a Schedule One substance, along with drugs like heroin, bath salts, and ecstasy that are subject to the strictest of the restrictions. These substances are considered to have no accepted medical use. The expected recommendation comes after the U.S. Health and Human Services Department following a U.S. Food and Drug Administration review at the direction of President Biden. The new reclassification proposal will recognize the medical uses of cannabis, acknowledge it has less potential for abuse than some of the nation's most dangerous drugs. However, it will not legalize marijuana outright for recreational use on the federal level. Four states, along with the three advocacy groups, are suing the Biden administration. It's one of the latest lawsuits against Biden's recent updates to Title IX. The lawsuit says the administration is overreaching its authority. NTD's Jason Blair reports. The Biden administration finalized the updates with Title IX on April 19th. The changes broaden the 1972 statute to encompass discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, sex characteristics, and sex stereotypes. It also removes wording previously used to safeguard women's sports. They don't have the power, basically, to make these kinds of sweeping changes to American civil rights law with the stroke of a pen. Inez Stepman, the senior policy analyst for the Independent Women's Forum, a plaintiff in the case, says that if the Biden administration wants to include gender identity in the word sex, they need to go to Congress to change it. 
instead they've done this end run around with this 1972 statute, which really not only does it not say that in the statute, um, it says the opposite. The lawsuit was filed by the Independent Women's Forum, Parents Defending Education, Speech First, and the states of Alabama, Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina. The announcement was made Monday and said the rewrite makes women vulnerable in bathrooms and, quote, requires speech codes that indoctrinate young students with gender ideology. They also argue the regulation ends basic due process rights by, quote, limiting individuals accused of sexual harassment from defending themselves. So we hope that courts, first of all, will stay this and, and pre prevent it from going into effect before we have our say in court. Um, and then second, we'll strike this down, not just on administrative basis, not just because it's plainly not what the law says, that 1972 Title IX law, uh, but also because it's just far beyond the power of the executive branch. It's far beyond the power of, of agencies of the Department of Education uh, to be able to just completely rewrite the law this way. Texas and Louisiana are also suing Biden over the new changes in a separate lawsuit announced yesterday. And today, Tennessee, West Virginia, Indiana, and former NCAA swimmer Riley Gaines announced a lawsuit as well. Jason Blair, NTD News. We'll take a short break now, everybody, but here's a look at what we have for you when we come back. RFK Jr. qualifies as the independent presidential candidate for the November ballot in California. From an immigrant to a lottery jackpot winner, a man from Oregon shares how the price will help him fight cancer and support his family. The U.S. and Mexico withdraw their joint bid to host the 2027 FIFA Women's World Cup. Find out why and what their new focus will be. Those stories and more coming up on NTD Tonight. Welcome back to NTD Tonight. I'm your host, David Zhang. RFK Jr. is officially on the California presidential ballot. He received a nomination from the American Independent Party. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. secured his spot on the California presidential ballot after receiving a nomination from the American Independent Party, or AIP. In a video on Tuesday, Kennedy said that he and his running mate, Nicole Shanahan, are officially qualified to appear on the ballot in California. According to the party's press release, the AIP is California's third largest qualified political party, with more than 835,000 registered voters in the state. In a statement, the AIP state chairman said, Our party is pleased to provide the opportunity for all 22 million voters in California to vote for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for president. Voters crave a real leader who will unite America. Last October, Kennedy announced that he would leave the Democratic Party's presidential primary and run as an independent. Since then, he has said multiple times that he would appear on the general election ballot in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. To combat anticipated challenges from Democrats and Republicans regarding the validity of signatures, Kennedy's campaign has said they are collecting 60 percent more signatures than required in every state. Three women were diagnosed with HIV after getting a so-called vampire facial procedure, according to the CDC. It happened in an unlicensed medical spa. I spoke with NTD's David Lamb for the story. Well, David, great to have you with us. So tell us what happened with the women and the clinic that gave these vampire officials. Yeah, David, thanks for having me. So this is the first documented case where um, women or people have been diagnosed with HIV being transferred from using needles for uh, facial procedures. So this is with uh, vampire facials. So three women went in f to rejuvenate their skin and unsuspectingly, they were later diagnosed with having HIV. So uh, the CDC said through an investigation, they found that this clinic in Albuquerque, Mexico, New Mexico, called VIP Spa, where you're reusing 
needles that were meant for one-time use and they weren't cleaning them properly as well. They couldn't find uh, the proper uh, sterilization machine inside the spa. So the owner, the previous owner, pleaded guilty in 2022. What exactly is a vampire facial? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So it has nothing to do with the moon or fangs, but it gets its name from the fact that it's the theory is to rejuvenate the skin, having the, the patient look more young, and you reduce scars, so hence vampire facial. So what it is, it's, it's microneedling, taking blood from uh, one part of the body and re-injecting it into the face. So, um, and you know, this has to be done co correctly or otherwise there's a risk of contamination. So it sounds like it's just a cosmetic procedure. And what are the dangers of getting those vampire facials? Yeah, so the danger is with unsterilized equipment. So in this situation, the medical practitioner wasn't licensed. So the former owner wasn't able to even conduct uh, vampire facials. So um, like I said, the investigation, they found um, unsterile equipment in, inside the spa. And um, the CDC says, with uh, any procedure, you need to have a medical licensed professional. So, um, you know, you could check for, ch do a background check on the clinic or the, check the credentials on the uh, medical professional or just do reviews on the place before going for a procedure. Right, the other day our reporter Christina Corona reported on fake Botox injections where patients had bad reactions after getting the treatment. So definitely important to keep an eye on the legitimate credentials. Well, thank you so much, David. Yep, thank you, David. Oregon's billion dollar Powerball jackpot winners have come to claim their prize money. One is an immigrant with cancer who will be sharing the winnings with his wife and a friend. One of the winners of a historic $1.3 billion Powerball jackpot last month is an immigrant from Laos. He has had cancer for eight years and had his latest chemotherapy treatment last week. To myself, I'm in the middle of the battle in cancer. So I've been thinking, how am I going to have time to spend all of this money? <laughs> In a news conference held by the Oregon Lottery, Chung Charlie Saifin of Portland said he and his wife, Duan Pen, would split the prize evenly with a friend, Liza Chow, who chipped in $100 to buy a batch of tickets with them. They are taking a lump sum payment, $422 million after taxes. And my life has been changed. Now I can bless my family and find a good doctor for myself. The winning Powerball ticket was sold in early April at a convenience store in Portland. The Oregon Lottery said it had to go through a security and vetting process before announcing the identity of the person who came forward to claim the prize. Under Oregon law, with few exceptions, lottery players cannot remain anonymous. Winners have a year to claim the top prize. According to the Oregon Lottery, the $1.3 billion prize is the fourth largest Powerball jackpot in history and the eighth largest among U.S. jackpot games. The biggest U.S. lottery jackpot won was $2.04 billion in California in 2022. Now turning our attention to the world of soccer. There is a big shakeup in the works. The United States and Mexico opt out of the 2027 Women's World Cup bid. NTD's Carlos Reyes has more on the story. The United States Soccer Federation and the Mexican Football Federation have decided to withdraw their bid to jointly host the 2027 Women's World Cup. Instead, they're setting their sights on the 2031 edition of the prestigious tournament. The decision announced on Monday comes as the FIFA Congress gears up to vote on the 2027 host, with contenders including Brazil and a joint bid from Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands. This move shifts the focus for the U.S. and Mexico to the next Women's World Cup cycle, aiming to secure the tournament for 2031. The reason behind this shift has multiple layers. First, the overlapping timeline with the 2028 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. It's a massive event in its own right and would have strained resources and attention. By waiting until 2031, organizers can ensure undivided focus and resources for what promises to be a groundbreaking event. U.S. Soccer President Cindy Parlo Cohn emphasized the importance of maximizing the impact of hosting a World Cup, highlighting the commitment to providing equitable experiences for players, fans, and stakeholders. This decision aligns with their vision for the growth and elevation of the women's game, both domestically and internationally. 
the joint bid for 2027 had ambitious projections, forecasting record-breaking attendance and revenue along with a call for equal investment in the men's tournament. However, by postponing their bid, the U.S. and Mexico are positioning themselves to deliver an even stronger proposal for 2031, building on the success and infrastructure of the 2026 Men's World Cup. For Mexico, this decision reflects their ambition to contribute to the continued growth of women's football, leveraging their experience and enthusiastic fan base. Meanwhile, the U.S., with its history of success hosting the Women's World Cup, sees an opportunity to further elevate the sport on home soil. Carlos Reyes, NTD News. Stay tuned for China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer coming up next. Made in USA or made in China? American home goods giant Williams Sonoma facing a record $3 million fine for selling misleading products. More on why made in USA should mean exactly that on China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And that's all we've got for you tonight. We'd like you to join us again on NTD tonight every weekday at 9 p.m. I'm David Zhang. Have a wonderful evening.